Welcome back. Way back when I was a kid, I remember seeing the VIC-20 in the department stores, Kmart I think it was, and they, they had the Atari 400 and, and 800 as well from, from what I can recall. But the, uh, the thing that put me off the VIC-20, well there were two things actually, the 22 column text mode and the 3.5k of RAM that was available to BASIC. Um, we, we had the BBC Micros at school, and of course they had the 40 and 80 column text and, and much more memory. So um, I fast forward 40 or so years and I actually do have a VIC-20 now. I can't do much about the 22 column text, but I can do something about the 3.5k of RAM. So um, yeah, let's dive in and, uh, and do something about that. Today I'll be building the VIC-20 Hyper Expander by Sven Peterson. Uh, it was apparently designed as a successor to the Super Expander 2 and it's gone through a couple of revisions since it was originally released. The boards I have, these ones, are the Revision 2 boards and support various different combinations of uh, RAM and ROM. I'll put a, a link to the, uh, the GitHub project and to Sven's website in the, uh, in the video description. In my case, I'll be building it with just the low RAM installed, which should if I'm reading the documentation correctly, give me 24K of RAM available to BASIC, and I'll have an EEPROM on board with a, a, a multi-image um, set of software burnt onto it. Um, at least that's, that's my understanding of how it all works. So um, yeah, we'll soon see. So uh, let's start building it. Um, I won't bore you with the uh, with, with a blow by blow of, of how to build one of these. I'm sure you've seen things soldered together a thousand times on, on YouTube. You probably don't want to see that again. So we'll, we'll just fly through that and then we'll get into having a play with it. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got the resistors, capacitors and, uh, and diodes on the board. So I'll probably move on now and put the, the reset switch and the dip switches on. Okay, so dip switches and, uh, and the reset switch are now in. So I reckon the next uh, well, probably the only thing left to do is uh, to put the IC sockets in. Okay, sockets are in, so we can put some chips in. Um, this one is going to be a RAM chip, and I have an appropriate chip here. This one's been recovered from something, so I hope it actually works. But we will see. Just got to make sure it's going to go in and not bend any legs. Looks good. Now we've got the uh, the EEPROM here, and I'm I'm going to be using an electrically erasable um, EEPROM here, uh, but I won't put that in yet because I've got to program it. And we've got a couple of TTL Logic chips here, so we'll put them in. And they will probably need their legs bending slightly if I can get hold of them. I should make a lead bender for this, but just or print one. I've just never got around to it. Right, so into, there we go, that one's in, rinse and repeat, right, and that way around, and oops, I've got a pin, I might have bent those slightly too far, but we will see, know, looks like it's going to be, okay. Those are in as well. So, better program to see from. So, I've got our software open here for the TL866 programmer. God, it's been a while since I've done this. It's an H58, not HN. No, an HN? I thought it was an HN. Let's just go for a 58C, 58C to, oh there it is, Atashi. Uh, so we'll go with that, right, and we'll load our binary, which is, I'll, I'll cover what this, uh, what this software includes shortly, what, what this binary file includes, but for now we'll just burn it. 
Uh, it's binary to the default region, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Actually, I wonder, before I do that, I wonder if this EEPROM is blank. It probably isn't. Well, those legs are splayed out fairly well, so, like it's new, so. We'll just give it a quick read and see what might be on it. Hmm, all zeros. For some reason I thought they had all Fs in them when they were... Yeah, no, there's something, something in it by the look of it. So we better load our image again, because we've just loaded what was on the, uh, the EEPROM into the buffer. So we better put our uh, actual software back. And I reckon we can just program that. I've already got it in the uh, 866, so we'll click program. And it's verified. So we should be good. Take that out, put that out of the way, and we should be able to put our EEPROM in the board. And it's in. There we go. Construction complete. And we're just going to have to set some dip switches. And I think we've got to put a jumper on there. So I'll just have a quick read up on that and um, then we'll get into doing that. Okay, so switches are set. So our jumper here, that determines whether the uh, ROM is 4K or 8K, and I've got that set to the 8K position, which is the default. Uh, these switches over here control the RAM. So as it's set, uh, switch 1 puts RAM at hex 2000 to 3 FFF. The next switch puts RAM at 4000 to 5 FFF. Next one at 6000 to 7 FFF. And then uh, switch 4 puts uh, RAM in the 0400 to 0 FFF range. Um, I haven't put RAM, like these, these next switches put RAM uh, up, well this one puts RAM up where the ROM is, and because I've got the ROM on the board I don't want to enable that. And these two put RAM in the IO space at 9800 to 9 FFF, and unless you're writing software that uses that specifically, uh, nothing will use it anyway. So I haven't um, haven't bothered to turn that on. On the ROM side, um, we have switch 5 here. Um, that puts the ROM into the A000 to BFFF address space. And these three jumpers here, or three switches here, control which um, 8K segment of address space in the ROM is mapped into the VIC-20's address space. Um, because I'm using an electrically erasable PROM, um, it has a slightly different pinout to a regular UV erasable PROM. So in this particular case, our jumper for A14 gets to remain permanently off. Um, we're jump our switch for, I should say, our switch for address 15 is actually address 14 because that's the pinout difference in the in the chips, and A13 is just as normal. So the uh, 58256 is only a 32k, 32 kilobyte um, EEPROM, so it only has four software image, four 8k images in it. If I had a, like a 27512, then I could have the full eight images. So yeah, a and in that case, these address lines would be as normal, um, but the documentation covers all of that. So with those settings established, uh, let's grab the VIC-20, plug it in and see what happens. So yeah, the way I've got this set here this, I believe, will come up with the, the image that I've got programmed on there. This should come up in the diagnostic code that runs the diagnostics for this card. So, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes.
So our VIC-20 is uh, turned off, obviously. The power LED is, uh, is off. We'll slide the card in and turn it on. It took the uh, Retro Tinker a second or two there to catch up. So we can see our 3K of RAM at 0400 is there and it's testing OK. Our three 8K banks are there and testing OK. And the two 1K banks um, that I didn't turn on in that upper memory, um, it hasn't found them. So it's not testing them. And we've been through four iterations so far. Five iterations. So a yeah, fairly basic uh, quick test, but seems that it's working. OK, so the VIC-20 is turned off. Um, flip switch number one, and this should take us back to the first 8K image in the EEPROM, which is the Super Expander software. We'll turn it on. Right, so we've got 28,023 bytes free. Now this memory configuration would normally give us 28,159 bytes free, but the Super Expander software uh, uses 136 bytes of RAM for itself, so that's uh, reduced our bytes free to 28,023. Um, we should also have the a monitor ROM at, what is it, 45056, I think? Yeah, and there's a VIC-20 Micromon. Um, no idea how to use that at this point, because I've never seen it before, but it it's clearly demonstrating that the... Uh, the ROM is working as well as the RAM. Now, next up, I'll put this in a case, and I've 3D printed a case earlier, um, and I'll, I'll put a link to the uh, the model that I downloaded for this um, in the, the video description. I do have to modify these slightly though, I, and I didn't see a, a complete model readily available that sort of suited what I wanted. So yeah, I have to modify these. I have to take these out here, like those off and I have to take these um, screw hole sort of mounts off as well. So uh, yeah, I'll get the Dremel out and uh, and take those off and I'll be back when that's done. Okay, so case modified. Um, the little standoffs that were there have now been removed. Uh, this one, I had to remove those standoffs that were, were here and I also had to take a piece out of the back here to accommodate where these switches sit. Um, this half already has it taken out, but but uh, this half didn't. And my capacitor here is marginally too high for the case, and I, I don't have anything shorter. Um, so I put a hole in the lid so it can poke through. So we'll put it together. Uh, this sits in here, and then pushes down in there like that. And then shoot that way. Must still be pushing on something. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of pressure up in here, but there's not much I can do about that. Short of taking that reset switch out entirely. Um, you can see my, my horrible cutting there. Um, it's not, not my best work, that's for sure, and that, <laughs> that, that bugs me. Um, yeah. Let's see what I can do about cleaning that up. I think I'm not, not a fan of that. Okay, so I've tidied it up a little bit, um, put a bit of a label on it. Um, obviously the capacitor still sticks through the hole, not much I can do about that. And I've tidied the slot at the back up just a, a little bit. I cheated, I glued it together. Um, yeah, the, um, I, I think the solution would be to either, well, build it without the sockets, which of course for the EEPROM doesn't make a lot of sense because you need to be able to remove it and reprogram it as you need to. So maybe a, uh, a lower profile socket would have been the go there. Um, 
the instructions do say that it, it fits in a, a regular super expander case even with IC sockets and it also fits in a case available from the future was 8bit.com uh, um, so it could just be this case that I'm using that uh, that it doesn't fit all that well now I, I did mention I think earlier that I was going to uh, explain the, uh, the software that's on it so uh, let's have a look at that so there's a couple of uh, pre-canned uh, EEPROM images available for download um, I'm using uh, set 2 not that it makes a lot of difference because the first four images in both cases are exactly the same anyway so I mean you can read it as well as I can but the uh, the first image is the super expander software which gives you the basic extensions for graphic and graphics and music uh, then you've got the uh, machine language monitor um, the RAM expansion test software that we looked at earlier and the PAL and NTSC VIC-20 diagnostics um, which need the, the diagnostic harness to run and I don't have a VIC-20 diagnostic harness um, now the second group of four images I don't have on my cartridge because I've only got a, a 32k electrically erasable PROM if I had a 64k EEPROM then I'd have all eight of the second set so I'd have the uh, debug 98 the X basic L2 SM and wax 4k I'd have both I'd have all four of those as well but as I say I only have a 32k electrically erasable um, EEPROM so uh, I don't have those so that's the, uh, the software that goes on it I mean you can you can obviously download EEPROM images and um, combine them together in any combination that you want and create your own sets of software uh, this is just what I've started with so that's a quick look at building the uh, VIC-20 Hyper Expander um, expansion cartridge. Um, hopefully that was useful to, uh, to someone out there. If you, if you liked it, feel free to tap that like button. It doesn't cost you a cent. And subscribe if, if you want to do that. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you on the next one. Cheers.